All right, I'll be bottom. <laughs> you did that on purpose. Well, a little bit. I just didn't. I just didn't think you would react so so strongly to that. It's just you're always bottom. I'm always top. I'm bottom. Hi everybody, I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. Season finale. Season finale. Part two. Yes. Because if you weren't watching our last or listening to our last podcast, you can find the link for it uh, around us and in the show notes. And uh, we talk, we, we defined and, and virtue ethics and provided some resources to read about that because today is the second part of the two part virtue ethics throwdown. But first, Icebreaker? Icebreaker. 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 All right. Um, since it's a season finale, we're going to take the opportunity to talk about our own stuff. Mm-hmm. So, Ryan, we have recorded, uh, I believe, 19 podcasts now, not counting the special audio editions. So it brings yeah. us up to 21. Yeah. So, uh, what is what was the best podcast to record, but also what was the hardest podcast to record? Uh, all right. So I'd say the best, or at least one of my favorites to record was when we discussed our philosophical stories. Um, it, mostly because it didn't really require a lot of work, but it was just really interesting to see our, how our history sent us into the direction of studying philosophy at UW. Um, because it teases out that idea that nobody really comes into philosophy through one route um and nobody really wants to get into philosophy for one particular job and very few people's parents are like you know what you should study you should study philosophy right uh so but it was really interesting to see how our own life experiences ended up shaping uh, shaping those decisions to, to lead it. So it was, it was really fun to talk about it and to see how, like, rehash my story, but also find out what your story was. So I, I really enjoyed that. Um, what about the hardest? The hardest um, was probably our class discussion, when we discussed class. Um, and for me, it was difficult, A, because I originally came into that planning session expecting to talk about politics. You and me both. Expecting to talk about provincial politics, because at the time, um, the provincial elections had just happened. And then as of recording now, I mean, our municipal elections have just passed. Yep. Um, so I came into it expecting to talk about one thing. And then through our discussion and our planning, we realized that there was a much more interesting concept or a much more interesting thing to talk about and what became really difficult for me in talking about class and it's it's not i don't think it has anything to do with me confronting my own privilege i mean that's uncomfortable in and of itself but i don't think that was the problem the problem for me was is i didn't really have a lot to contribute i felt very out of my element um in that discussion i mean you and i joked a little bit about you know you're moving up when the cheese starts to change at your social gatherings um, you know, we could laugh about things like that, but it was, for me, it was a real struggle to try to meaningfully, um, bring myself into that conversation and, and talk about things that really, um, if, if I did experience them in life, they were when I was really young or it involved like my mother and other elements of my life that just, I had no control over. Mm-hmm. So I would say that was the hardest to, to film. Um, but in a, in a general looking over the last season um it was it was really it was a really fun project to uh, to get involved with um and it was it was just interesting to come you know week after week or every other week when we got together to to film and to to just be able to explore these ideas i mean i don't think we talked about it much when we first started but the goal of the podcast was to capture our conversations that we had over dinner on video and then put them up on the internet. Ironically, then we started eating dinner first and then making the videos. <laughs> and then having entirely better conversations before we made the videos. Um, so, but I, I would say it's been a, it's been a good run uh, for this season. I'm looking forward to next season, and I want to give a shout out uh, to Courtney and Eleni 
and it's like romper room up in this Christy but and Christy and my buddy Luke uh I found out when I went and visited my folks this weekend that my stepmom watches a few episodes here and there she liked David and Drew yeah. and all all of our all of our really faithful listeners who also leave comments yeah uh, if you leave comments you may wind up in a shout out uh, in season two, which is which is super fun. Yeah, so thank you, thank you for everybody for following us and helping us out with season one. Um, so Jim, what was your favorite? What was the hardest? And what are your general thoughts on? Oh man, season this one is getting complicated. This is like a three question <laughs> icebreaker. All right, so okay, so uh, so favorite. so my favorite my favorite one is probably art of unemployment. Um, Self care is something I, I I think about a lot. Self care is something I take really seriously. And it is something that I recommend for basically any human ever. You know, there, there's a point where your sanity and your happiness have to come first. And there is a there is a part, that is a part of life where it can be really hard to, to strike that balance. It is a thing that I struggle with, is a thing that I know lots of other people struggle with. So it was, and, and since making the Art of Unemployment podcast, which you of course can find over Huck's face and in the show notes... Um, I have gotten some really positive feedback from people about, you know, whether it's, whether it's, it's helped them structure their routine or, uh, help them think about what they want to get done. I mean, cause, cause everybody, we everybody works and takes care of themselves differently, but if we can, if we can help some people deal with, with some of the stress that happens when that's a part of your life, then that to me is the best. Mm-hmm. Um, hardest podcast, also the class podcast, but for different reasons that, uh, my, 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 my experience of class warfare is, is, is very strong and very direct. And that podcast brought up a lot of really personal stuff that there, there, there are definitely a few moments in in it, you can probably see it in the video where I am like close to tears, um, or shaking with anger, which I'm not supposed to do because I'm the funny guy. <laughs> You're the serious guy, Ryan. <laughs> That's how this works. Know your role. <laughs> but yeah, so I I. That was definitely the hardest one for me, um, because it was it was emotionally difficult. And I look forward. I, I I I enjoy it because of that. But at the same time, it was it was a big sort of hurdle to step over. And reflections on the season. I don't know. We got a whole season. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh. But I am ex- I am excited for for season two. But that's partly because we've already planned a bunch of season two. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I know what's going to happen, and I can tell everybody listening that it's going to be super cool. Before uh, before we launch the discussion, um, so I, just to continue the icebreaker for a minute, so you filmed a fair number of vlogs, and then you filmed this first season. Um, what do you have any thoughts about um, what it's like vlogging and doing the the podcasting? For me, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. Um, but, um, like, do you find that, um, these kinds of things are stimulating or do you, they are. And, and the more, the more of it you do much, much like practicing virtue ethics, um, nice segue that I'm going going to abandon. Um, the more of it you do, the easier it is to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I have actually, as, as, as we are recording this, I have not recorded a blog in quite a while that I have put out. Um, cause I have had a ton of other stuff going on and I viscerally regret it mm-hmm. when a day goes by and I don't like make a video or post a video or write a blog post. I'm like, man, I really wanted to write about that thing mm-hmm. or do a video about that thing. And I just, it just, but it, but it's, it's, it's like any other habit. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing is, is once you get the bug for it, it's great. I've probably, I don't know, in the past three years, I've written over 600 blog posts. I've mm-hmm. made over 200 videos and I still want to make more. Mm-hmm. Still got fun stuff that I want to do or fun places I want to go or, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's, it's been a while. 
uh, and it's been too long. But uh, it's uh, my my reflections on how this is different. Um, it's a lot more structured because we we have to work together on it, mm-hmm. and especially working with uh, Ryan and Gina on the audio versions. Um, it can be. By the way, if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, during October, because October was Halloween month, we put out two special edition audio casts with some awesome costume rioters, and uh, you should go check them out. Uh, the link is in the show notes. If you are listening to this, then you already know about those episodes, and you're super cool. Also, you should duck, because you're probably like walking through a public place. <laughs> anyway... Um, no, my reflections on, on how the, how the podcast is different. Um, for one thing, I usually don't eat dinner before I make videos. I usually do it after, but also it's, it's more structured. We tend to have more notes because we, we want to have a, a better discussion and because we have to be able to talk about it and because we don't edit it. Mm-hmm. We, we, we do the whole podcast in one take, which means you get the ums and ahs and all of the bits of us being human beings but it also means that we need to be on the ball when it comes to our topic as opposed to a video where i can i have definitely had that video where i i deliver the same line 12 times and then just take the one i want Mm -hmm. you know because you you've got to have more energy you've got to have more you know be more upbeat because it's only five minutes long Mm -hmm. or as the podcast is you know 35 40 but yeah, I'm I'm very satisfied with what we've done. I'm really looking forward to next season. If you who are listening are also looking forward to next season, or if there's something cool that you would like to hear us talk about next season, by all means, leave a comment, and we will probably reply to it, and we will probably even do it. Uh, though we do have a bunch of th- cool things already planned. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this is the second part of the Virtue Ethics Throwdown, the two-part Virtue Ethics Throwdown, and I, today, will take the piss out of Virtue Ethics. And it's going to be fun because um, I have not academically engaged with Virtue Ethics in a little bit, and so a lot of my answers are just going to come from me trying to work through how, how I'm going to rationalize and defend Virtue ethics. So there might not be a season two because Ryan and I might not be friends after this. <laughs> is what is what we're saying. Um, no, virtue ethics. We talked about it last episode. Uh, we talked about what it is, mm-hmm. the sort of Aristotelian motto of doing the right thing at the right time in the right place. Mm-hmm. Um, the the nature of moral virtues like courage and temperance and wisdom. Uh, the rule of the mean. The notion that every virtue exists on a continuum um and it and it's and it lies in the middle and we talked about paragons Mm -hmm. who are the people that you look up to and embody a specific virtue or a set of virtues and the first problem i have and this is i i say i and by i i mean collective scholarship that did not pull this off her own the first problem ryan that emmanuel kant has as he because because he's the one that, that well he's the first one where i read this one uh in uh foundations uh, of a metaphysics of morals i always get the title wrong but is that these virtues temperance and wisdom and courage they don't necessitate that i do good things i mean in the same way that uh, there's nothing about slavery in the Ten Commandments. Uh, there's nothing about compassion in these virtues. There's nothing that, that compels me to take an interest in others or in their well-being um, or, or in my own goodness. It merely necessitates that I am brave and wise and do things in moderation. But that would make me an excellent villain. Mm-hmm. I mean, many villains are brave. And they take incredible risks. I'm, for the purposes of this, I am not talking about actual real life villains because I am hesitant to compliment Paul Pot. But fictional villains like the Penguin. I mean, at every moment, the Penguin has to worry about Batman bursting through his roof and punching his face in. Mm-hmm. So he has to take all kinds of risks. 
Not to mention Batman. He has to worry about other villains like Two Face or Killer Croc or the Joker. And they're just going to, I mean, they, they could just kick in his doors and, and shoot up his place or take his things. And so it seems like he has to be brave. He also has to exercise moderation. If he commits too many crimes, the police take an interest. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Batman takes an interest, which is even worse. If, but if he doesn't commit any crimes at all, not only does he, you know, damage his income, but he loses his reputation as a criminal, which is almost, which is for him almost worse. You know, it's hard, it's hard for him to exist in a, in a criminal world if he's not committing some kind of villainy. Mm-hmm. So I mean, temp, temperance, you know, the right amount of crimes seems perfectly fine. And wisdom, I mean, everybody wants to have wisdom. Wisdom mm-hmm. is what helps you not get caught. Mm-hmm. Is the penguin a virtue, a, a, a virtuous guy? Um, so my immediate reaction to that is that has less to do with virtues and more to do with being just a good criminal. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily virtues. Um, and the reason why I say that is, well, first, okay, so I'm going to be a little bit blasphemous here and say that just because you're going to talk about Batman in a negative way. No, I am going to anti it and say that Aristotle does not necessarily have the definitive, all-encompassing account of virtue ethics. I don't think that just because it's not written in Aristotle's works means that it's something that um, is, a, is a short falling of okay. the theory. No, no that seems fairly reasonable. But I mean, even if you move forward to, to um, Aquinas basis' ethics on, mm-hmm. on, on Aristotle... Um, and actually, Aquinas, um, Aquinas would be a good example here because he's starting to infuse some of the uh, the Christian virtues mm-hmm. into it. Um, I would say, like for example, compassion is probably a, a mean between two extremes of of almost apathy mm-hmm. and caring so much that it hurts you. I think you can be in in some regards compassionate without regard to your own well being. So I think. I think that just because Aristotle, as a Greek man, a Greek free man, did not write about compassion, doesn't mean that um, that necessarily that it's not a true virtue. Okay. Um, so I think a virtuous person would have compassion and would display the right levels of compassion. Um, for example, if you do want to go with Batman and you want to take a specific example from the movies, <laughs> Batman does not show Ra's al Ghul compassion the second time they meet on the, like on the train. Yeah. He says, like, I don't have to save you. you know, I'm not going to kill you, so he's not, I'm not going to go that extreme. I feel, like, I feel like, though, not saving someone... Is probably wrong. Is killing them. Yeah, no, it's probably wrong, I'm saying. But, I mean, like, if but a lot of people tend to hold that action... As somehow being good. Now, granted, the Christopher Nolan movies have a fantastic are a fantastic case study of just what happens in a post nine eleven world and how we view heroes and how we view security and how we view like the state and whatnot. Like mm-hmm. it's it's wrong for the state to have the NSA spying on everybody, but it's perfectly fine for a Batman to find the Joker that way. You know, it's it's really funny to see how we applaud applaud a hero in one sense and vilify a government for ostensibly trying to do or have the same outcome of catching bad that, guys. That is an entirely That is an entirely podcast, different step. But, but so I'm coming back to it. So so for example, I think I think you can make a, a strong case that compassion is a virtue. And I okay. and I think that that especially with the person that you are, that would resonate really strongly it with does. you because compassion is um, a very It's important. interesting to me because uh, in some of the virtue ethics uh, scholarship that I've been reading to prepare for this, um, I think it was, it was her. No, it wasn't her house, It was Foot, who who says that that uh, because virtue is a property of the will, it has to come from goodwill. Mm-hmm. You have to do things for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's not a virtue. It's just an action that it, that resembles a virtue. Mm-hmm. And I actually I find the notion of compassion as a as a central virtue more compelling than that. Mm-hmm. Um, I am I am entirely doing Philip of Foot's uh, argument a disservice, but. Mm-hmm. That is that is sort of the issue with having a forty minute podcast. Mm-hmm. But well, and for example, com- uh, you have a good will. You can have a good will and still discharge compassion poorly. Mm-hmm. Um, every not every. I'm categorizing too much. 
um, the college age student who goes over to a third world country to build stuff mm -hmm. is showing compassion but might not be doing the right thing for that community right okay. so i mean like there there are good actions so you, you have to you have to you have to exercise your compassion and temper it with courage and wisdom and temperance and virtues like that yeah and be sensitive to cultural needs to so, to so this brings needs. me into a different problem so well just let's, let's just uh so <laughs> In terms of the virtuous villains, I think that yeah, you can you can be extremely moderate, you can be extremely temperate, you can be extremely courageous, but I don't necessarily think that that's a problem for the virtue ethicists to think of because they're really good at the skills that allow them to be a criminal, but that doesn't necessarily make them a virtuous person. Mm, okay, so so here's here's the thing is that so. We, we, we've got a person who's, who is compassionate mm -hmm. and who, who, I mean, compassion, like you say, it, it works in conjunction with other virtues. Um, and one of the other arguments that comes up a lot in, in virtue ethics is in order to have one virtue really to truly have it because you have to do it in the right place at the right time, you, you have to have all of the virtues. Mm-hmm. I mean, compassion is useless if you are not brave enough to act on it. Mm -hmm. um, and allies, yeah. For example C from last can, episode, yeah. C um, courage is is useless if you're drunk all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, if you are intemperate, mm -hmm. um, you know we can we can look at, at temperance. Temperance is useless if it is born out of cowardice. If you do not drink. Or, or or partake in in, in in things because you are afraid mm -hmm. then that is different than if you do not do so because you are in control mm -hmm. there, there is I'm, 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 I'm not about to cast to cast a judgment on that but I think we can agree that there, there's a there's an appreciable difference there mm -hmm. um, and and those are so the issue with having, I mean, you can't even really have compassion without having all of the other ones. Yeah, this is, you've brought this up before, I believe, at least in the pre-discussions we've talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, this is, um, this is where I um, weasel my way out of the problem with sticking to my cherry-picking virtue ethicist. Um, I think... In Aristotle's idealized case, or in anybody else who writes about the idealized um, moral virtue or moral paragon, they do have it. I think that reality, we have to face reality that we're not perfect. We're not ideally mm -hmm. rational. That's why, like, economics for a lot, like, a lot of flaws in economics can be stemmed to just assuming an ideal rational agent. Yes. Right? So I think we abstract away from the way we really are and we don't appreciate those kind of limitations and why I'm perfectly happy with cherry picking virtues uh, from different people um, and being comfortable with that despite that person being a not a bad person, but despite that person maybe having moral flaws in other areas of their life so the thing that bothers me about it though and we talked last episode right near the end about normative ideals and the idea that it is okay to set a goal and have a goal that you can never reach mm -hmm. but the notion of, com of of completeness of needing all virtues in order to have one of them means that not only can I never be a truly virtuous person? Uh, I can never even have one. Is is that the way it's cashed out, though? Is it you can't have any of the virtues unless you have them all? Or is it you cannot be a good person or no, you cannot be you, wise you, you unless you have them all? That's the thing is is, is, is the example of, of courage. You need wisdom to, to, and, and temperance in order to be properly courageous. You need courage and wisdom in order to be properly temperate. See, I would I would say you can have courage in the absence of wisdom. It's just you're not you're not. If you have courage in the absence of wisdom, then you are courage. You're courageous when it is foolish to be so. Yeah, so, it's 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 kind of hard to. 
it's kind of hard to weasel my way out of this one. Um, the only thing I can say in regards to that really is like you have maybe maybe just split my terms so that I'm not equivocating. You have bravery. You just don't know how to channel it appropriately. It's kind of yeah. like you have. You have the strength to be able to draw a bow, but you don't have the skill to be able to shoot the arrow at the target. Okay, right? but, but I mean, if, if that is true, then, then since you don't use your courage at, at the right time, mm. in the right way, then, then you don't have the virtue of courage. No, true. And you know what? Uh, when, pressed, when pressed all the way, I'll just, I'll just agree with you. Yeah, I guess if you don't have... If it's, you don't it's, have a diff- it's, a, it's a problem. Yeah, if you don't have all the virtues, you have none of them. Uh, and I, I'll just default to what I said last time. You just have to accept that you are failing most of your life. All of your life. As long, yeah, I, I guess you can never reach at, it. At, at any virtue. That seems highly demoralizing. I don't know. I find life demoralizing in general. The, the quicker you can accept <laughs> welcome that. To, welcome to the existential terror of being a philosopher. Yeah. No, I I... I think I think it's okay to bite the bullet on that. I just yeah. I just think that that as as ethical systems go, one that one that doesn't give you any offer you any kind of payoff and instead offers you nothing but a lifetime of struggle toward an impossible ideal, like a truly impossible ideal to, to which you could not even achieve one tiny piece. Um, well, there is something really super ancient Greek about it. Or French, <laughs> or French, because you know what I I need to get around to reading the original the, the essay, but I've read enough about it, and I've read uh, especially the analogy, the myth of Sisyphus and Camus. Oh, it's a good time. Finding meaning in the struggle that ultimately yeah, is there's something there's something vaguely existential about that. Yeah, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. I never formally studied existentialism, but you know I've read Camus a little bit of Camus and Sartre and whatnot, uh, Kierkegaard and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's, it's there's, yeah, there, there's something there's something fundamentally existential about that. Yeah. I personally don't have a problem with the idea of constantly striving towards uh, an impossible goal, an impossible goal, because uh, I do find meaning in the struggle, and I find meaning in making progress. It's kind of like me working out at the gym. I guess you know, it's it's I'm never. I suppose if your impossible goal is at the gym is to like lift a house or turn invisible. Yeah, or leap a tall building in a single bound. Well, I, I think it's there's impossible, and then there's unreasonable, and then there's reasonable. I mean, it's reasonable for me to continue to build on strength. It's fairly unreasonable of me to ever expect to be a um, cover model, right? To drop down to four percent body fat and below, and to be able to display. Muscle. What do you think, commenters? Rate this, Ryan. <laughs> I, I think I think it's slightly unreasonable to me to expect to get to that point. But as long as I don't have an unreasonable expectation, but I can still work towards right. it, you know. All right, we'll we'll we'll, bra- we'll, we'll bracket it. Okay. Um, paragons. Mm-hmm. So I worry about paragons, and I worry about paragons because of Jordan Belfort. And explain who Jordan Belfort. So Jordan is. Belfort. Was a con man mm-hmm. and a trader and a stockbroker and a salesman, and he uh, he had a movie come out last year, this mm-hmm. year, earlier this year, um, about him and his life, The Wolf of Wall Street. It's a, it's a great movie, and lots of people really admire Jordan Belfort for his go get him attitude because he had such a giant go get him attitude that he went and got people's life savings and then stole it. He was just like, yeah. I remember because my 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 Twitter and my Facebook filled up with people with people who were like, you know, business advice from Jordan Belfort, which is which is weird because getting business adv- like getting getting trading advice from Jordan Belfort is like getting Adolf Hitler to plan the the seating at your wedding dinner. Yes, he's probably going to get the job done. But not in a way that you expect or maybe would like at all. Yeah. I mean, we well, don't in the same way that we 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 don't admire Bonnie and Clyde for their go get him attitude. Yeah. And but but we could set these people up as as paragons. I mean, Genghis Khan is a is a popular example. Genghis Khan is the most successful human being 
in the history of the world. In, in the history of ever, Genghis Khan has ruled the most territory, uh, controlled the largest empire, and, and, and had the most proportional to time wealth. Genghis Khan so, killed so many people, it cooled the earth a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, but we could hold him up as a paragon of, of courage. A uh, paragon. This is, this is tied in with the, the notion of virtuous villains, but at the same time, it is hard to say that Genghis Khan, who is a warrior, who led armies in battle, and who, who planned strategy and won victories is not properly courageous. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is difficult to say that he does not have wisdom. And, and because we're, we're, we're cherry-picking virtue ethicists, mm-hmm. so, I mean, we don't need to worry too, too much about the compassion. We can admire him and hold him up as a paragon of, say, courage. Mm-hmm. But that seems like a problem because I feel like if I met a person who said, you know, I really admire Genghis Khan for the way he just got things done. I worry um, that that person is going to raid my yurt and uh, in the middle of the night and uh, steal my horses and possibly make off with my women folk. Mm-hmm. That is a concern that I have. <laughs> because when you think, what would Genghis Khan do... That's what he would do. Mm-hmm. You know, what would Jordan Belfort do? He would steal all your money. Yeah. No, this is this is definitely an issue. And it, you know what? It, it might sound silly to discuss, but um, a, relevant, a relevant example really done, comes down to, like, the cult of personality when it comes to um, celebrity worship and stuff. Okay. So you really admire them for this or that achievement or this or that thing. And then they do something or something comes to light and suddenly you have to reevaluate whether or not you want to look up to this person. Um, you know, like Hitler was Times Man of the Year at one point. He was Times Man of the Year in a, in, in, in a, in a bad way, though. though that yeah. was a last-minute editorial decision. Yeah, well, yeah. so maybe maybe that doesn't fit in with, with the example. Mussolini was, though. Yeah. And, 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 and they, were pretty, they were pretty behind him. Yeah, so I, I think that this is, a, this is an actual problem. But I, or I would like to think that the case of whether or not Genghis Khan is a nice guy is yeah. pretty settled. Yo, no, 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 no. But yeah, I'm talking about... Um, what would be a really good example? Um, I don't know. Gandhi. Okay. Gandhi yeah. no, Gandhi, advocated peace. Example. Advocated peace. Horrible racist in that when he was uh, working in a paper in like South Africa. Mm-hmm. Right? Mother Teresa. Wonderful woman for like trying to tend to the poor. But those poor houses that she had were very poorly managed and whatnot. Right? I mean like there's... That you can always find holes and things to pick at with with individuals that are typically held up as as more more ex- exemplars. So I hesitate to think that leading an army that conquers most of Europe is a is a a, a hole that you find. But, yeah, no. but I mean, in the, in the sense that so the, the I'm, thing no, is, I'm, that I'm, I'm trying to stick to or, my I'm, my my worry about it is sort of, to sort of articulate my my worry more clearly. It's that nothing stops me in virtue ethics from holding up Genghis Khan as a paragon, um, and in fact, like I said, he seems to make a very strong case for it. <laughs> but there seems to be this prevailing opinion that. I shouldn't. And this maybe goes back to the fact that Genghis Khan doesn't have lots of other virtues, like Mm -hmm. probably temperance. Mm -hmm. Genghis Khan, not a man famous for his control. Mm -hmm. Um, Or, you know, um, I I, I guess, what's the virtue that stops you from kidnapping people? He probably doesn't have that one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's there's lots of things that he he probably, he didn't have. Mm -hmm. Um, But if I get to pick... And I pick, like, if I get to pick my paragons, and I should, and I and and my paragon is Genghis Khan. I mean, arguably, that's going to lead me astray mm-hmm. uh, and away from virtues. But what stops me from doing that? Yeah. I mean, I can just if I if 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 Genghis Khan suits my idea of virtues, then 
my so yeah my only uh, my only solution to this is ultimately I want to I want to find a solution that doesn't ultimately come down to the no true Scots um, solution. That, seems, that of, seems like a reasonable yeah, thing to want. Yeah, I, no true person of virtue would ever do this. Is is kind so, of a so meaningless thing. What, what I what I mean maybe maybe the solution is I have to understand part of the virtue that I'm looking for in a paragon mm-hmm. in order to pick one. I guess or accepting or understanding the limitations of what it is you're trying to admire in the person. I mean, like, yeah, you can, you can say admire the ruthless efficiencies in the way an atrocity is carried out. But really, that, I mean, that that's seems, not, that seems horrible. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take your example of like somebody who's done something wrong and like you're finding something to admire in them, but it's, I, I don't know. It just, but it's like, it's like silver lining inside the exhaust fumes. That's yeah, no, no, and that's what that's that's what I'm trying to get at. It's like when you're trying to when you're defending defending your choice so much by narrowing in on this really tiny little mm-hmm. section of it. Okay, so. I, I think it might be just missing missing the point. Like there are far better examples, or there are far there are far more compassionate sure individuals I mean, that no, you can no admire. one has led. Uh, better or 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 larger armies than Genghis Khan. No one has conquered more territory. I mean, that's the thing. He's mm-hmm. the most successful human mm-hmm. ever and by 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 yeah the the values of success espoused yeah. by his yeah. culture and no. by European culture in that time. Yeah. No. And the the big thing, uh, the other thing I would say is, um, I think I think virtue ethics, along with every other ethical theory, needs to ensure that it's relevant to the current time in which it finds itself. Okay. So updating the virtues from Aristotle to more well, present and, day. So I mean, I admire Genghis Khan's go get him attitude. I admire yeah. his 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 willingness to take risks and yeah. and things like that. But but I think I think that leads into a, a, a the, the the idea that I have to understand the virtue in order to pick my paragon properly mm-hmm. seems to lead into a different issue, which is that if I understand the virtue sufficiently, that I could pick. A proper paragon. Uh, pick a proper paragon is the tongue twister of the uh, week, by the way. Mm-hmm. But uh, if I could pick a proper paragon, then do I need my paragon anymore? Because I understand what I need to learn from them. It seems like they don't have anything more to teach me. Mm-hmm. Because I understand what I have to learn. And if I understand it, it's not like learning facts. What I'm trying to learn is is a behavior. So I actually have an answer for this that I just thought of now that I didn't think of when we were working in the the pre-show. Uh, let me let me try to explain it by way of analogy. Um, okay, so Ryan, the analogy guy. Sure. Um, okay, when you learn how to drive, right? You uh, you study the book, so you learn everything you can from the book. Um, you take driver's ed. You learn from an individual. Um, you get lots of experience, right? So, it, well, by the time you say you get your G license, there's a pretty good chance that you know really how to drive a car. Like you, you understand how to drive, right? Mm-hmm. But that doesn't say that just because you understand the like the basics, like the definition, the the concepts of driving, that you are able to successfully drive in every single contingent condition that comes up right Mm -hmm. so the first time you get thrown into a giant thick foggy patch of road right you understand the principles of of um you know turning off high beams if you had them on and you know going down to the fog lights kind of deal um but you don't really like you're you have to draw upon it helps to draw upon the experiences of others or when you're driving through like blizzard conditions, you know, it's terrifying to do that. The way I see virtue coming out in that or cash out in that regard is you can understand the definition of what it means to be courage or courageous. You can understand what it means to show courage, but sometimes you don't know how to, how to discharge courage in every single case. So uh, a little bit more relevant example for me would be um, when I became a security guard took the course. I understand the mechanics of being a security guard. Uh, I got my license. 
Um, then they threw me uh, into the, the bathroom position at the bar because it is the best place to learn how to be observant in the bar because of the amount of territory you have to watch as the guard, the amount of people that you're going to be interacting with because everybody has to use a washroom or has to go to the washroom at some point and mm-hmm. most people at a bar at some point will go th- in and out of the washroom, right? Um, but that's not to say that Every single time I'm interacting with a customer or dealing with a problem, I'm going to know exactly how to, to go about doing it. So the, I think we're doing a little bit of a disservice if we say that uh, if I understand courage enough to pick a mentor, that I think we're not appreciating the complexity of what's going on in this virtue. I mean, virtues are, as you pointed out, they're very basic, uh, not basic mm-hmm. But they're very base. Like it's they're, you don't they're very rock bottom. There's not much lower you can really pick it apart. But when it comes to discharging the virtues or discharging your behaviors in accordance with virtue, I think that we're not appreciating the nuances of reality and the complexities of other people. Because that's the other thing. I I'm with Sart. Hell is other people. Other people make things incredibly difficult, <laughs> and a lot of times. When you're dealing with other people, if you know if they weren't there, things would be a lot simpler, yes. right? This, this bar would be so much easier to manage if it was empty. We might not make as much money, but it would be a lot easier to manage if there were the less Ryan people. Huckle business model. Yeah, you um, can tell so, I'm never going to make money. So, so that, that would be how I. That would be one response. Okay. Uh, that, I think one of my stronger responses. So, as someone who has learned how to drive, mm-hmm. um, and but does not actually drive Mm -hmm. um it seems to me that what you are describing is that the best the only way to learn how to drive and how to deal with conditions isn't to be told about them uh by a by a mentor and paragons are not mentors you usually don't have that kind of relationship with Mm -hmm. your paragon uh paragon i mean i mean superman is is arguably a, a paragon or wonder woman or um, you know, like fictional characters can be can be moral paragons. In fact, they make really great moral paragons often because they don't have human flaws, and that also makes them really boring fictional characters. Mm-hmm. But I, the only way for me to learn how to deal with those or how to drive in general is by doing it mm-hmm. and making errors and correcting errors and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I feel like it's weird to think that if I were on the road. And I'm like, what? What would Ricky Bobby do? Mm-hmm. What would what would my drive or just my driving instructor? What would my driving instructor do mm-hmm. when I when he's out here? That that is a weird way to think about it. Rather than especially if I already know all of the procedures, because what my driving mm-hmm. instructor would tell me is to do that. I was uh, t- I was trying to simplify into a skill because it would be the same mm-hmm. thing with the virtuous villains of you know like if I wanted to go and rob this bank. You know how would I how would I execute this in such a way that I could you know do it better so to speak? I was I was using it as an example, uh, mm-hmm. and then the same with the the security guard example of you can learn you can know what it takes to be a, a brave security guard, having never had to step in the middle of a bar fight yeah. or having never uh, had to rush in. To yeah, go well, and that's, and that's a lack of experience, but it yeah. doesn't seem. It doesn't seem like the notion of a of a paragon would help me there. What, what mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't. My paragon doesn't help me be brave. My paragon tells me what I know I sh- what I should do, but mm-hmm. I already know what I should do. Yeah, but the, so what what usually happens with me, especially when I make mistakes at the bar and I get active feedback from more senior, more experienced people, is I take that and I internalize that yeah. of this is how it should be done. Or, this and, is and how I seems, can do and that seems, and, and, yeah, and that seems perfectly yeah. reasonable. I mean, nobody's going to get it right the first time every time. Yeah, but. There's a there's a sense in which, um, if I if I under, if I understand I mean and, and and you know the the idea with virtues is that is that they are they're 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 elemental, they they exist they're, they're on a basic level, and that if I understand it well enough, um, to understand that that that, that especially because being a paragon is such a nuanced thing to be, because mm-hmm. Genghis Khan. Is, Maybe not a paragon of courage. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there's, there's. It, so I already have to have a, a presumably a reasonably nuanced understanding of this virtue. That I, I sort of, I sort of don't need them. 
Mm-hmm. But I guess I'm willing to bracket it. The, 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 last, the last thing that I, the, 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 or shot that I would love to take at virtue ethics uh, is that there exists this, this one virtue that we have been talking about the whole time and that Aristotle talks about and that every virtue ethicist talks about. It is the most important virtue, the super virtue. Mm-hmm. And it seems like while all the virtues are a mean, I could never have too much wisdom. Mm-hmm. Too much intelligence, and you're a smart ass. Mm-hmm. You're a know it all. Mm-hmm. But too much wisdom. Mm-hmm. Wisdom doesn't make you a know it all. Wisdom, if you have so much wisdom, you know when to keep your mouth shut. Mm-hmm. And you know when to offer that wisdom and when not to. You know when to be courageous and when not to because you are wise. And it's so it seems like that is it doesn't sit on a mean. We got this whole rule of mean going. We got we got temperateness, which is on a mean. We've got courage. We got compassion, which we introduce. We've got some the one that uh, um, Philip Afoot introduces is justice. Mm-hmm. Society that is that, that ex- exemplifies the moral virtues must have temperateness, uh, courage, justice, and wisdom, and. So I've got, but I've got wisdom here at the bottom, and the dial just goes to eleven. Yeah, wisdom is the one that seems to be the most binary. It's either, one of, it's either up and, or and, down. And if yes I and no. if I and if I if I have wisdom, and I am so wise, one day maybe, mm-hmm. probably not ever. If I am so wise that I know when to be courageous and I know how to be courageous. Um, and then I, you know, and I, and I am wise enough to know that I must be courageous, and I am. And the same with temperate, and the same. With, do I really need any of the other virtues, or should I just be wise? Being wise seems like a really great deal. I don't think you could. I, the way I conceive of it, and this might be wrong. Um, this might be. I always see wisdom as kind of the emergent one. Again, it comes down to uh, unless you have all of them, you have none of them, right? So unless you have all, unless you have all of them, that's when you kind of max out your, your you cap out your level ninety nine. You can be no wiser, right? Kind of deal. I, it feels like it feels like wisdom is until something they release like, the patch and raise the level cap. Until, yeah, until until they release the patch. So when Aristotle decides to release the next patch, of look when we re- when we find Aristotle's <laughs> patch notes, you're gonna be so embarrassed. Uh, also, you'll find out that virtue ethics totally got nerfed in the patch. Yeah, maybe. Um, but that's 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 kind of the way I've I've tried to make sense of it in my mind is that wisdom ultimately becomes uh, wisdom, prudence, um, phronesis, however you want to uh, term it. It ultimately is kind of an emergent thing that you gain you gain an understanding of when it is appropriate to act, what, when it's appropriate to act, how, how you're to act and whatnot, that comes out of, um, tackling with the other virtues. It's, you know, learning to be a better security guard. You Mm -hmm. you don't make the same mistakes. You learn not to be aggressive all the time. You don't have to be a meathead and fight all the time that there's better ways of doing your job and of, um, I mean, you can succeed the job by being aggressive all the time, but it's not a good way to be a security guard. Um, not just because you'll probably get fired for being a meathead, but like it's you, you slowly accumulated over time. Some people seem wise because they're able to, to make the connections faster or, they get it right the first time and they never have to learn by trial and error. You know, it's just they happen to, on the first trial, get it. But um, that's a lot of times how I see wisdom. Um, it's just the emergent property of having or working on your virtues. Maybe it's not a, satis- it's not a satisfying answer. But ultimately, that's why I like virtue ethics because I don't have to try to proselytize other people. <laughs> as long as it makes sense to me and I don't bother anybody else with it, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, I mean, I am not a virtue ethicist. Um, I, I hold to a sort of best practice-y, uh, wishy-washy stakeholder thing that I wrote my thesis on. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and we'll maybe do a two-part stakeholder theory throwdown uh, next season. But <laughs> depends on how the virtue ethics one goes. If you guys like it, then, then leave a comment. Yeah. Um, and we'll see about it. But, I mean, ultimately, as, as, as much as I make fun of virtue, virtue ethics, uh, and I will, I will continually and forever poke fun at you for being a die-hard... Virtue ethics. ethics cherry picking. The, cherry, cherry, cherry picking, picking virtue ethics. ethics. To the point where you've just defended it for almost two hours. No. I, uh, uh, it, it, is, it does not seem like a terrible way to run your life. It is unlikely that you will meet virtue ethics, uh, people who believe in, in virtuous people or in, or in practicing virtues, who also think that, you know, the, the best person that they could, who, whose example they could follow is Genghis Khan. Yeah. That's... It's, it's not likely. It's 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 maybe it's it's a it's a blind spot of virtue ethics, but it's not a blind spot that a lot of people live in. Mm-hmm. At least I hope not. No, but there are a lot of assholes out there, though. So well, I, I I would hope that the Venn diagram of people who are jerks and people who are virtue ethicists is, has a reasonably small overlap. Yeah, but then again, Aristotle doesn't recognize compassion as a virtue. So what are you going to do? Yeah, uh, not to say that just because it wasn't a part of the culture excuses it, but yeah. it really was a different culture. It's hard to it's hard to compare apples. Yeah, to well, and that's the thing. It's been two and a half thousand years. We've had time, and, and that's the thing. There's lots of contemporary virtue ethics scholarship that's still going on. Yeah, um, there's lots of really interesting things being written about it, and like I said, it is not a terrible way to run your life. And uh, to be, again... It's just an- not the right way. Perhaps. Ryan. Perhaps. Um, to be anti wubnik again, um, there was... Uh, most of most of the time, the Greeks are held up as, like, the golden age of civilization. And I don't remember who... It was a lecture series I was listening to, but somebody said, no, they're the infants of society. They, yes. were, the, they were the precursors. Just because um, they came first and had a whole bunch of innovations, which, by the way... They weren't necessarily the first ones to innovate. Hello, Egypt and China. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're, they're probably the Aristotle probably wasn't the first virtue ethicist when you when you really get down to it. But nevertheless, um, yeah, we've come a long way, and we've realized that we need to amend and make addendums to the canon. I feel like so so and 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 this is this is this is a terribly existentialist thing to say and it's going to be super depressing for the end of our season but <laughs> when people talk about as somebody who who spent a lot of time studying ancient history in in university uh when people talk about you know the 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 past and and the romanticism of the past that we we tend to do in the golden age of of society whether that's when people lived off the land or people were you know, more you know, more self sufficient, or they weren't continually bothered by their iPhones. Um, the The thing with the golden age of society is that we live in it now. People are better off; they have more opportunities; they have they have longer lifespans. And as much as we 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 sort of wander through our lives often thinking about how much they suck. This is the best that we have ever had. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it still sucks just means that we've got farther to go. We have to continue to work on the virtues. Oh. I think, you know, I think that's as as existential as it is. That also has a kernel of truth that um, just because it's the best it's ever been now does not mean it's the best it's ever going to be. I hope and not. we can continue to work. We can continue to the forward progress, and you know what? Learn from our mistakes, adjust our values, realize that we need to jettison old ways of thinking in favor of new, more egalitarian thinking. Yeah. And, um, but I, I and I think that is the uh, the message that we should we should exit our first season on. Seems like a good way to cap off season one. Nice feather in the hat. So yeah, thank you so much for listening or watching or both to the the first season of the Concept Crucible podcast. There will be a link at the end if you if you want to if if this is your first episode, then welcome. And there's a link at the end if you want to go back to the to the beginning of the playlist. Uh, we will be back in 2015 with a new season, and we've got a lot of exciting stuff planned. God forbid there might be more than just two of us. It's going to be a really good time. We're going to travel a bit, so I recommend the video version as well as the audio version. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, but the audio version is much better to carry on your iPod. You yeah. fit in your pocket now. It's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for, for watching and listening mm -hmm. and commenting. And I hope that you comment more because it's a lot of fun. And we will be back next year. But for the last time this year, I am Jim. And I'm Ryan. And we are signing off. Stay awesome. And bottom. There we go. That was a solid hit. Did you see that? That was a solid hit. There's a, there's a lot of energy put into that. This is the Concept Crucible podcast where we have bunk beds. Yeah. Oh, man. That's a hell of a way to end this series, I suppose. <laughs> totally reverse our high five. Yeah. It shows growth. Versatility yeah. and bedexterity. Yeah. Well, we couldn't get it right the last time we filmed. I know, it was hilarious. This was, I, I awkwardly was trying to hit you. Seems so. <laughs> <laughs>